Hi, my name is Stephanie, and today I want to talk to you about autism and apraxia. And you might be thinking, apraxia certainly sounds a lot like dyspraxia, something we've already covered. And you're right. A great amount of sources use them interchangeably. If you're getting very technical, apraxia means no praxis, dyspraxia means basically difficulty with or a problem with praxis, which is technically more accurate in general but it does appear that there are some distinctions. And I also want to talk to you about different forms of apraxia and how that might help you understand a bit more about non-speakers and why some people may appear to not understand when they do. Now to begin with, I want to help you understand some things about neuroscience and something very simple is th this idea that different parts of the brain do different things or at least are primarily responsible for them. Now, of course, your brain works all together and is quite incredible at being able to make new connections when necessary and adapt when damage occurs, etc. But essentially, there are certain areas of the brain that are specifically in charge of certain things. And that often means that there are distinctions between what is responsible for what and something we might consider to be all together. What I mean by that is, for example, if I were to reach out to you right now, you might consider that to be one area of the brain just did this, but this is actually involving a lot of different things inside of your brain. There's actually a difference in the ability to come up with an action or a motor plan to visualize that in your mind and to actually execute it the way that you visualized it. Another example is language. You need different things for being able to hear and actually comprehend those sounds as a language, to be able to give actual meaning to specific words, and to be able to speak coherently or say the right words that you actually mean when you speak. If something is going wrong in any part of that process, certain signs might manifest. This can be incredibly frustrating when we apply this to non-speakers, whether that is non-speakers with autism or those with other disabilities. The reason this is especially frustrating is someone who can't speak we rely on their actions to be able to indicate understanding. So a lot of times there'll be simple indication type tests or match this or maybe tap this for yes or no or this is green and this is blue or whatever. And there are a lot of non-speakers who have failed these tests to go on to be able to use things like spelling to communicate, which we've discussed in another video, because there was more training with the motor planning that wasn't there before. So then someone who can't use words and their body betrays them when taking an indication test or in other situations, maybe they can't reliably take that indication test, etc. They're assumed to not understand and not be able to communicate very well other than through frustration. So as we begin to understand this concept that motor actions sometimes are involuntary or are voluntarily done wrong by the brain because different parts are responsible for different things. So if there's an issue in one chain of the whole entire process, there can be a serious disruption in what is happening outside. It helps us to understand that so that way we can understand that someone who's making strange movements or doesn't seem to understand because of the way they use their body, that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have intelligence. The part of your brain that is responsible for motor things, praxis basically, planning the motor, being able to execute that, that has nothing to do with someone's ability to understand you. Now, while this information is well available, if you actually want to go looking for it, information unfortunately does take time to circulate and to be accepted and understood. Just like if you consider the DSM-5, it was released in 2013, and there are still people to this day who are surprised that Asperger's has been put under autism spectrum disorder. Thus, newer information, it can take time to be understood and accepted, so there might be professionals who fall prey to old understandings and old assumptions about people 
regarding their intelligence because of their motor activity. Now, despite being told that basically apraxia and dyspraxia are the same thing, if you are looking into apraxia and dyspraxia as I was, I found some distinctions between how people use these terms, at least in papers. So I'm gonna share with you a little bit about what it appears to be the difference between apraxia and dyspraxia, at least as it shows up in the literature. A 1997 paper reveals some of the thought behind the different terms. The term developmental dyspraxia implies a disruption during the development of praxis. The term apraxia implies a disruption after praxis has been developed as a result of a brain lesion. More sophisticated diagnostic techniques have shown brain abnormalities in some children with dyspraxia. Furthermore, behavior similarities in persons with the two disorders have been observed. The paper concludes that subjects with dyspraxia or apraxia make similar errors, suggesting that the praxis behaviors are similar. So although this paper is old, it does show us that developmental dyspraxia was used as a term for dyspraxia symptoms or whatever seen in those with developmental disorders or disabilities and apraxia was often used specifically when someone had that motor praxis ability but lost it due to a brain lesion. Regardless, the developmental dyspraxia versus the apraxia caused by a lesion actually look quite similar in behavior, so it's not really that easy to tell the difference between them. This may explain why we tend to use dyspraxia and apraxia interchangeably, although I have seen a lot of people use dyspraxia and even maybe myself and how I perceived it as dyspraxia being the more motor difficulties but in control while apraxia was like super out of control, apraxia of speech kind of stuff, but either way usually these terms are indicating the same issues with motor planning. Apraxia is defined as the inability to perform a skilled or learned act that cannot be explained by an elementary motor or sensory deficit or language comprehension disorder. While we know that autistic people do have sensory issues, that really doesn't have anything to do with the kind of dyspraxic or apraxic motor movement issues that we're seeing and the ability to basically walk or move around kind of rules out the idea of an elementary motor disorder. Now, something interesting about apraxia is that there are actually different sections or types of apraxia that are recognized. Ideational apraxia, when there is a failure to conceive or formulate a series of acts, either spontaneously or to command. For example, when writing and sending a letter, the patient with apraxia may seal the envelope before inserting the letter. Ideomotor apraxia, when the patient may know and remember the planned action, but cannot execute it with either hand. For example, cutting a piece of paper with scissors. Conduction apraxia, when the patient shows a greater impairment when imitating movements than when pantomiming to command. Disassociation apraxia, when the patient cannot gesture normally to command, but can perform well with imitation and actual tools and objects and conceptual apraxia, when the patient makes content and tool selection errors. For example, when asked to demonstrate the use of a screwdriver, the patient may use it as if it were a hammer. Now, these different classifications and types of apraxia can really help us to understand someone who is non-speaking with apraxia that also affects other motor movements. This is because it stands to reason that if you're capable of reaching out, then you should be able to select what you intend to select, thus indicating understanding. But if there is an issue with a certain type of apraxia or a certain piece of the overall ability to do this, then you're going to see someone perhaps unintentionally select the wrong thing because of the apraxia. There are further breakdowns of apraxic behaviors as outlined in one paper about Alzheimer's. These impairments result in eight distinct patterns of apraxic behavior involving the ability to pantomime the use of a gesture, imitate it concurrent with experimenter demonstration, and to imitate a gesture after the experimenter had completed it, that is, after a brief delay. 
This means that apraxia can look quite different from person to person. Potentially, someone could have an issue with being able to pantomime or be able to imitate an action while the instructor is doing it, but be able to do that action after a brief time delay of seeing the practitioner do that. Such strange looking anomalies can lead someone to think that the results are inconsistent and thus the times where someone seems like they understand must not be actually accurate. But that's just a lack of understanding of what apraxia is and what kind of effects it can cause. So non-speakers may have multiple forms of apraxia. Most non-speakers have what is called childhood apraxia of speech, which is defined as a speech disorder in which a child's brain has difficulty coordinating the complex oral movements needed to create sounds into syllables, syllables into words, and words into phrases. However, you can have more than one form of apraxia. So someone with childhood apraxia of speech can also have limb apraxia. When someone has multiple forms of apraxia, then it becomes difficult for them to communicate and it can also become difficult for someone to assess cognitive ability and understanding. Many people want to know if apraxia can go away. In some cases of acquired apraxia, where there's been a lesion to the brain or something to that effect, it has spontaneously resolved before in some cases. This is not a thing that happens with childhood apraxia of speech, which requires therapy to help improve, and this is usually done with a speech-language pathologist. Most sources say that apraxia can be helped but not cured or grown out of. Professionals and others working with autistic individuals really need to become more educated on apraxia, as one three-year study indicated that 64% of participants originally diagnosed with autism also had apraxia. Most of the information I'm finding on apraxia has to do with acquired apraxia, basically maybe after a brain lesion, etc. And in those, I'm seeing quite a lack of attempts to treat the apraxia itself. One paper reflects on a treatment called Apraxia Rehabilitative Treatment Program, or ARTP, that has shown long-lasting performance gains and generalization. This was specific to tool use, where participants were given tools, shown pictures illustrating the gesture that belonged to the tool, then asked to pantomime, then asked to pantomime to tool pictures. This is unique in that no other apraxia treatment studies have been able to show generalization. Hopefully there will be more research applied to helping those with apraxia, both developmental and acquired. Occupational therapy and other traditional therapies have been shown to have positive results for those with apraxia. However, of course, the apraxia still persists in general. Hopefully this helped you understand more about apraxia, the different types of apraxia, why some things are called dyspraxia, apraxia all the praxias, <laughs> and hopefully it helps you understand a bit more about the complexities behind non-speaking autism and non-speakers in general, including those who are not autistic. Thank you so much for watching. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below, and if you're interested in hearing more autism-related topics from me, you can go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I do attempt to upload every Thursday at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time, but it's been more kind of an as- able basis recently. Thank you to everyone who supports me here on YouTube as YouTube channel members, through Ko-fi, and as patrons on Patreon. And a special thank you to my spinny stimmy tier patron, Jack Varney. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful week and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!